Hi everybody, I'm Joyce Bock from Salubrious Events. And before I share with you part two of Captain Randy Kramer's talk on recovering his repressed memories from the Secret Space Program, I just wanted to uh, let you know a couple of things. The first is that um, it the, the talk was at an actual online live talk. So it's been edited to edit out the audience when they ask questions or when their face appears. And so if the video skips, it, that is the reason why. And the second thing is I wanted to share with you my experiences um, about recovering memories. Um, uh, I'm in Melbourne, in Victoria, Australia, and have been going through one of the most severe lockdowns due to COVID. And during that time, one of the good things, I guess, uh, about it was that I was able to slow down and go within more and have more quiet time. And during that time, I noticed that randomly, I, I was getting waves of memories come to me. So I might just be just walking or washing the dishes or reading or something. And then I'll feel this wave of a memory. It might be like a childhood memory at a particular place or a workplace where I'm just sitting, sitting in the sun, eating lunch or, or something like, you know, something quite appears quite mundane. But um, when I get these memories, I... I can really feel the feelings and it's almost like it's got its own unique energy signature around it. And yeah, so, it, so it's like, oh, wow, I forgot. I forgot about that and I forgot how it felt to be there. So when I get those waves, I would um, try and go into it more and hold on to it a bit more to really savor it and it doesn't last long it might last a few seconds and I, I say it's like a wave because that's the best metaphor I can find to describe what it feels like it's like a when the wave hits you goes through you and then goes out again so it's like when you wake up and you, you've got remnants of the um, memory of a dream, but then it starts to tether off. So it's a bit like that, except I'm in waking life and I'm getting these memories of the past and I'm just really noticing them. And some are memories which maybe I needed to look into and process things that I haven't resolved. And then there were just other memories that uh, just seems, you know, uh, a bit mundane or frivolous but I am enjoying feeling those memories. Now, an interesting thing is that some of these memories are not memories from this actual lifetime or this reality or this place that I'm currently living in. And, but it has the same feeling. It's like this wave and I know how it feels and it's different from an imagination or a fanciful thought I can tell the difference usually they're more cerebral like more kind of in my head and I it takes effort to try and construct those fantasies or imaginations uh, whereas these memories are full-bodied and it's got this really unique feeling it's like you could feel yourself back there and it's unique to that situation in that time so for example I have a memory of um these round discs like flat discs that uh that I am um, strap a couple of them that I strap onto my shoes and then I can step up, up up onto the air and it allows me to basically fly but but it's more like more like rollerblading like you can go up up and up and um just movements like um your rollerblading except it's a lot more smooth and I have memories of that just going above water but it's really smooth and really fast so I'm not I'm not dismissing it I'm just going to savor it and just um, allow it 
and just see where it takes me. So that's what I'm doing in terms of recovering memories. And I'm not just rejecting it, saying it's just nothing. It's just a fantasy. It's not, it's not something that I deliberately construct. It's like, it's got the same feeling as when I had uh, the memories of the childhood or in the past. So I'm taking note of that. So I still feel like I'm very early on in this journey, but also in dreams as well. There's certain dreams that appear or feel so real that I am surprised when I wake up and think that was a dream. So I'll write them down and in as much detail as I can. And then I'll just leave it and um, see what happens because later on you can come back and see a pattern or, or see pieces of like a jigsaw puzzle um, that you could put together. So I'll, I'll um, yeah, I just wanted to share that personal experience. If you've got a personal experience, I'd love to hear about it. I'll put my email address down below and uh, yeah, please feel free to share. If I don't get back to you, um, you know, in a short period of time, it's just that I'm just busy but I do read them and um, I'll try and get back to you but um, uh, yeah enjoy this talk and um, yeah please feel free to share and um, yeah subscribe yeah if you like the video like it so thank you so much for listening and um, yeah enjoy every time it's this freaking image of this alien being holding me in the air crushing my throat and my balls in my dining room at age 11 in what I think may or may not have been a dream based on again the linear sort of the linear experience of it of waking up at the end so with that place to start uh, I, I will want to be very very clear that I went into the process as a super skeptic. So with that on the table in front of me as my evidence or my indicators of where I had to go with this, um, the last thing I did was go, oh, well, there's some crazy extraterrestrial, uh, something weird technology stuff happening here and I should just go like sort that out. No. At no point was I looking at what bits and pieces that I had on the table in front of me and going, yeah, okay, that. <clears throat> in fact, I, again, I was incredibly skeptical of everything that I had in front of me. I was just like, okay, I don't know what this is. But the last thing I'm going to do is just accept it outright. Like, this is a thing. This is what's happening. And I just need to get over it. Like, that was not what was on my mind uh, when I – when I started, what was on my mind was I have a strange anomaly series of them, like a, a pile of puzzle pieces of, of anomalies that don't make linear sense with what seems to be my linear experience of my memory at the time. And yet connects to undeniably vivid uh, images and recollections and what any amount of looking into those flashes and images and bits of memory only get more flashes, bits of memory, some, in some cases what I would call like a, a video chunk. And when I get a video chunk, again, because of the photographic memory, I can actually play it frontwards, play it backwards, pause it, and actually change the angle at which I am seeing the experience take place. I can look at it like it's happening through my own two eyes, or I can pull back like a third person view and look at the entire thing as if I'm standing 10 feet away. And again, back forward with vivid clarity when it, once I have a clip. Sometimes I didn't have that much. Sometimes I just had a couple snapshots or a few snapshots or one snapshot. But each one of these things was connected to an intense visceral experience that was 
pretty much the same as the memory of this experience of this extraterrestrial being in my dining room, which was terror, shock, and a sense from the entire central nervous system that something incredibly shocking and mark leaving had occurred that whatever had happened whatever these bits were they had hit hard they had left an impact they had left a vivid traumatic shocking terrifying painful impact which left a fingerprint of all of those emotional experiences attached to these either again individual snapshots tiny groups of snapshots or tiny chunks of what i would call at you know at that point a video clip which was you know enough of a memory that i could watch it back and forth and like really look at it but that's about it that was about all i had and i was absolutely skeptical that it was what it looked like at that point i was just like no i, I what i have is an anomaly i have something i don't understand and what I have to do is I have to understand it. And the only way I can understand it is by taking the incredibly long, slow, painstaking process of looking at each and every piece of this really slowly, really deliberately, and seeing how much more I can get to with what I have. If I really push hard, in a meditative state through a flash or an image and I push through the emotional defensive response, which for the most part, when I would, you know, look or feel at these memories would recoil, right? The sense that I was going to, I'm going to look right into this memory. I would see where it was. I would see that again, that snapshot, that little bit, and I would move to enter into that memory so that I could replay it or relive it. And would recoil, go, no, no, I'm not doing that. That's not happening. No, 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 not going there. No, no, thank you. No, 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 thank you very much. Don't need to do that. Not going there. This is intense recoil. So it took some real, like, emotional control to be able to be in control of my physical faculties, my breathing, my thoughts, my ability to sit still during what was nothing less than a incredibly elevated panic attack of fear, terror, and heart-pounding adrenaline. So as I became sort of emotionally disciplined enough to go, it's, it's just a reaction. Like, I'm not going to die if I remember this thing that scares me to death. Whatever it is, I'll get to it and I'll learn something about myself from it. And I may or may not get the truth that I want, which was just the truth. It wasn't like what I wanted. Well, you know, that's not what I mean. I mean, I wanted the truth, whatever that was. But maybe I'd get something that got me closer to that. Maybe I'd get something that leaned me in the direction that I'd get closer to understanding what the truth was. And that would be worth it. Because what I had as an anomaly was completely unacceptable for me to have unanswered in my life. Like what I was looking at essentially made me have to ask the question, well, okay, e either one of two things is really occurring here. Either I, I have something that's occurring that's creating the most delusionally divergent um, sort of, you know, illusionally manifested alternate reality of my own personal experience, my own existence in my brain, either that's happening or there's something that's legit. And I don't know which it is at the, again, at that point, at that stage, I didn't know. I, I knew that I didn't know, but I knew that I had to know whichever it was a or B it's like one or the other, whichever one it is, I want to know because if I don't know, I'm going to go my whole life not wondering if I should be doing something different. But if I know, then how I conduct my life based on what the answer to this anomaly is satisfies at least one question of do I accept that I'm going left or that I'm going right in this fork in the road?
with what's happening with my life. I didn't know what it was. I knew that I had to know. I knew that if I didn't know, I would never sleep at night. I would never be okay. I would just continue to have symptoms that drove me crazy and drove my partners crazy and drove my family crazy because it was so anomalous and so unlike sort of the normal regular person that I was when I was not having these, you know, like emotional trigger reactions um, that I had to have the answer to whatever that was. And in, and in that stage, at that early stage, I simply did not know, but I knew that I had to know, but that's what I started with. And from there was a incredibly lengthy process. Just, I think getting through the first decade. The first decade, I got very little progress. For the first decade, I would reach into a memory fragment and I would get, in some cases, nothing more than the fragment that I already had. Or in some cases, I would get only, again, the tediest, tiniest of additional fragments. So if I'm looking at a snapshot of something that occurred or seems to have occurred has all again all of the sensory uh, aspects of an experience and all of the emotional responses of an experience that whatever that is it's it's either one of these things or the other and if i know which it is then i can conduct myself appropriately, whatever that means. So again, 10 years to get to a place where I had maybe twice as many fragments as I had 10 years before that. Felt like I had made almost no progress. However, what I would say was my higher self at the time uh, took me on a journey away from where I was living to uh, the state of Colorado where I happened to run into some really interesting people. And the people that I ran into were as a meditation group who had some pretty interesting beliefs about some things compared to what I knew or believed at the time. I was raised in a fairly um, Americana, uh, old-fashioned uh, Christian household. Not too fanatical sometimes, um, and, but, you know, just sort of kind of old fashioned. That was sort of my raising of my worldview as a, what I think a smart person, I never like disavowed the idea that there was extraterrestrial life. I kind of presumed at that stage in my life that it was a given that somewhere in the universe, there was smart beings that had developed technology that we had never seen because reason kind of dictated that that was probably true. But I had no opinions about it, and I'd certainly done no research on it, and I'd read no books on it, and I'd never really watched a documentary or a movie about it other than Hollywood stuff or fiction stuff like other people had seen. So I really didn't have an opinion. But I all of a sudden found myself surrounded by people who had read a few books and had some opinions. And so I began to just tinker in my thought, you know, these thoughts in my brain. Hmm what if there is something to this and it makes sense and because of what's happening with this part of what I see in memory fragments has something to do as well as this incredibly vivid memory of this experience when I was 11 years old that I got to remember every instant of it from the very beginning to the very end of it that maybe I can accept that there's a reasonable possibility that there is something extraterrestrial happening here or something just that I can just accept as weird and not normal and that I can I can maybe be okay with that because I found myself around a group of people that who were sound grounded healthy functional people who uh, did not go around behaving like weird kooky people with kooky belief systems. They seemed like they had very normal um, businesses that they operated, jobs that they did. One of them uh, was actually 
and the time that I knew her elected mayor to this small town uh, that we lived in. So these were, you know, really civically upstanding, socially respected people who, you know, did not come from weird marginal backgrounds or have histories of being messed up in the head. These were like a bunch of sort of upstanding members of their community, civically, socially, economically. And so there was this ability for me to sort of normalize that in my brain that, well, maybe I don't have to be totally in denial that there's something to all of this that has to do with non-terrestrial human life. Maybe I can accept that. And it was some, I'll even say months of being around uh, very open-minded people who were very grounded who, you know, we talked about meditation, meditative techniques and had a you know, meditation group that we met on a weekly basis. That after some months, I started to have this progress with these memory fragments that I had not seen in the previous decade. That all of a sudden, these long bits of memory film started to roll out from these fragments. And I was like, oh, okay, I have more to look at. I have more to examine. And I spent a tremendous amount of time um, looking at these fragments with deep, vivid, meticulous clarity again and again and again and again. I, I would often, you know, go to a fragment, look at the memory and go, huh, nope. And I would discard the idea that I accepted it as I saw it. I felt like I had to scrutinize what I was experiencing, what I was recalling through sensory uh, memory recollection, that I had to be really sure. I couldn't just be kind of sure. I couldn't just be sort of sure. I couldn't just be pretty sure. I had to be 101 sure. And in order to be that sure, I couldn't just accept uh, a fragment or a memory film strip as it was outright. I would look at it and just go, no, I got to look at this harder. I have to look at this longer. I have to peel at this. I have to push and poke and prod at it and see if there's something behind it or something else going on here. I have to do my absolute best to scrutinize what I'm seeing and, and being able to, again, mentally look at these memories, to scrutinize them as much or more than I would if this was paper evidence, film evidence, video evidence, audio evidence, that I was attempting to be a good detective and get to the bottom of. And so through my own necessity to do this, I ended up becoming not a bad detective who understands that to be a good detective, you have to be dedicated to critical thinking. You have to be dedicated to looking at what you're looking at as data, uh, as not as absolutes, but as evidence towards a larger picture that you're trying to figure out. And that you can't accept everything you see. You can't accept everything you might think is a possibility. You can't accept just every theory that you might have. You have to kind of examine a lot. And you have to test theories. And you have to test ideas. And see what, using critical thinking, not any kind of pre-designed desire for outcome, to get to something that is truthful. And the way in which I achieved that was by being incredibly dedicated to the notion, again, of, that I had to know the truth for me personally. I had no intention at, the, at any of these stages that I'm recollecting here of having the notion of wanting to have a conversation with what was happening about this with another human being, to share this with my family, to share this with my friends, to share this with the world. At no point, at no point, as I was going through this, that I think, I'm going to share this with the world someday. Oh, no. No, if, if anything, this was like my deep, dirty secret that I couldn't tell anybody. There's nobody that I could tell this to. There's nobody I could share this with. All of a sudden, if I became the person who was saying, hey, 
here's this thing I remember, here's this other stuff I remember. I know that most of the people in my world are going to look at me like I'm the crazy person, like I'm the kooky crazy person. There's no way I could do that. I kept it completely to myself. It was only after being around some really um, differing thinkers around the subject that I began to get, again, more. And after some time through this meditation group, met a couple of what I would call really like advanced, more experienced teachers at some of the things that I was trying to understand than I was, who in no way, shape or form tried to tell me what was happening or tried to explain to me what was happening. More importantly, they asked me to ask myself certain questions. And that when I asked myself those questions, the answers that I got were shocking, but interesting, and started to, again, by just adding more puzzle pieces, more segments of memory film, began to take what was this really big blank space in my linear memory with these patches over it that had the crudest of picture of what was going on or what had occurred but that as i asked myself the right questions and examined more of these slices of memory and stretched them out further you know to before where that memory slice begins and after where it ended so extending it you know frontwards and backwards to get a bigger scope of what occurred in that you know chunk of memory that usually again because of the nature of the trauma in most cases the earliest memories were the ones that were the most shocking the most horrific uh the most traumatizing and the most uh horrifically terrible things that you a person would just not want to remember if they had buried those things so there was again this intense emotional discipline that i had to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing myself to get through this and by again meeting some people who got me to ask the right questions i got more and more and more and more and i got better at it and better at it and better at it as far as retrieving the memories that were buried and what started to happen was i started to change as a person because all of a sudden there were these bits of me that were coming back to me and I was remembering them and I was like, Oh wait, I, I did do that. Like I, that was an experience that I had. Oh, that's why I know how to do that. Oh, that's why I react to that that way. Oh, that's, I mean, it started to answer all the questions that I'd had that I, I was puzzled by that I had this anomaly with all these questions. All those questions started to get answered with me asking the right questions to get to the chunks of vivid memory that I could look at again and again and again and again and again and again and again until I was certain of what I was looking at. So 10, 15 years go by. I've got most of my memories from this set of experiences back. I, I know where it started. I know where most, most of what happened, remember most of what happened in childhood and adolescence, remember what happened when I was deployed, remember what happened during that deployment or certainly big chunks of major events that had occurred chronologically through those experiences from what I experienced at that time was from the beginning to the end, but that was not quite correct. But I had, had more than 50, 60, maybe even 75% recall at that point. It was, it, it was so clear at that point what had occurred and what was happening because I had more memories that just made it that clear. And I was, as that process was happening, I became a more whole person, literally. So all of the symptoms that I was experiencing uh, from the PTSD started to subside. Uh, the anxiety went away, the depression went away, the insomnia went away, the 
chronic fatigue went away, the fibromyalgia went away, um, the hypersensitivity to light and sound went away, the nausea went away, the IBS went away, the night terrors went away, the nightmares went away. So if there's any like relationship of cause and effect here, um, it is super clear from the effect of what I was doing that I was healing myself, that I, I was recovering uh, you know, damage that had been done to my psyche, potentially to the neurobiology of my brain, uh, to my emotional body, to my emotional person I had been horribly traumatized through all of this, and that I was healing it because I was getting better. I was the symptoms of what had been plaguing me my entire life finally were getting better. And when I got to a place, again, after about 20 years, that at the time I did think was total recall. I had a 20-year tour. Boom, got it. I'm good. Remembered as much as I think or more probably than most people could recall of, of you know, a 20-year period of their life, of, of a career or of a military career. Felt like that I had recollection of that that was probably better than most people remember about their own lives and their own experiences. Turns out there was another chunk that I got to just this last year. That's another story. I won't digress by talking about that too much right at the moment. But it was about 20 years before this lengthy painstaking process came to a place where I was like, okay, I think I understand what's happening. I think I got it now. I think I've dealt with who I am, what I am, what happened to me in a way that I can maybe have relationships in my life that aren't completely fucked up and dysfunctional. And maybe I can treat myself and other people like a decent human being instead of like someone who's horribly traumatized and messed up and doesn't know which it is up in their life. Maybe I'm good from this point out. Well, it was pretty good. I was having a pretty decent uh, sort of life at that point that I felt that I had repaired. But it was not long after I think I got to Total Recall in which I was contacted by superiors in my chain of command who were like, oh, now that you've gone through this entire process, would you like to go public with your story? Would you like to talk about it to people? No, I was like, no, are you kidding me? No. I, why would I want to talk about that to people? Why would I want to share that with people? Why would I want to talk about something that I have spent the last 20 years digging into as horrible, traumatic, terrifying, shocking, emotionally disturbing, and symptomatically like, psychologically and emotionally damaging in my life that I have spent the last 20 years putting back together so that I can be a healed the whole person. You've got to be fucking kidding me. There's no way that I want to do that. Not on your life. My brigadier uh, and I spoke about this for a, about two weeks where we had some sort of continuing discussion uh, on a near daily basis about this for about two weeks. There were some interesting and compelling aspects of what he was saying was good or bad, positive or negative, about taking this path and doing this. But to be honest, what really sold it to me, what really got me to agree to that I would, okay, I'll do it, was when he said to me, he said, look, he said, you know, you're not the only person who's been through this. Like, you know, you're just one soldier of many. You know that you served with many people who uh, came back and may be experiencing some of the th same things that you experienced as far as a residual traumatic effects, flashes, bits of memory that they don't know what to do with. He said, how many people do you think are walking around out there who are lost and confused and traumatized and terrified and think that they've lost their minds and don't know where to turn. 
And I was like, well, it's probably a lot. He said, for sure it's a lot. Now, he said, would you like to be able, at the very least, to make lemonade out of lemons and take that horrible piece of shit of experiences that you've spent the last couple of decades to heal and, and, and get to some semblance of personal peace with, would you like to take that crap pile and turn it into something that can help people? that just might be able to make the process for another person be not as difficult or not as strenuous or maybe even just at the very minimum less lonely because they don't feel like there's nobody that they could possibly talk to or listen to because they've never heard anybody say anything of the kind um, of what this set of experiences is like. Because at the time, uh, there really wasn't anybody who was talking about uh, the sort of repressed uh, covert military space program memories. I believe there may have been one person, uh, and it may have been Michael Ralph, but it was not like there was a, a community ripe of people who were talking about it. And that is because, again, this was an, an area territory that I was completely unfamiliar with. I still didn't spend time like researching exopolitics, ufology, like, you know, listening to people's stories, surfing on the internet for this kind of stuff. I honestly didn't want to know what other people knew. I honestly didn't want to have any idea what other people thought was going on or what they knew was going on because I knew that I had to get to my own personal truth and I just didn't want to listen to what other people had to say. So even at that point, even at near total recall, I still uh, didn't know much of anything of what was occurring and the, again, the exopolitics, ufology communities was just not a thing that I spent any amount of time in. Uh, and it was only after finally deciding to take a peek into that area that I was like, I thought I heard of Michael Ruff and I was like, oh, there is like one other guy in, like, that has said that some of these things have also happened to him. So, um, and it was, um, it, it was kind of encouraging uh, to just feel like, oh, okay, maybe I have not, haven't completely lost my mind. And even at that point, even at Total Recall, I was like, well, maybe I haven't lost my mind. Maybe because this other person turns out they've been talking about this for a little while that I had never heard of because I didn't bother again to do anything to look into exopolitics or ufology. So I was like, okay, maybe, maybe I can do this. Maybe it's okay. Maybe I can help people. Maybe I can bring some sense of peace and understanding to people who've had to suffer. And maybe I can do that through this PR thing that my brigadier is asking me to do that I don't really want to do. I don't really want to talk about my personal experiences. I don't really want to talk about, tell my stories all the time. I don't really want to share with people about uh, what I had to do as a soldier during my career because most of it sucked. Most of it was horrible. Most of it was terrifying. Most of it was shocking. Most of it was nightmarishly, horrifically gory. So there's really no motivation for me to want to have these conversations with people and tell these stories. Other than that it may bring somebody who has their own set of experiences that they're sorting out, be able to go, okay, Maybe I can get my own shit together. Maybe I can figure out how to heal and restore my own self. Maybe I can get my life back by digging into whatever may be buried memories and getting to some semblance of truth, maybe. And it's, it, to be honest, that is just really what motivates me and why I do what I do why I do this PR gig for my superiors because there are people out there who have suffered in much of the same way that I have suffered, who have gone through it with no one to talk to about it, with no family or friends that they could share about it with. And if they don't have something that they can connect to, then we end up with an all too common problem, which is the rates of veteran suicide. Um, and if you just look, at the suicide rates from soldiers who came back from Iraq and Afghanistan for a 20 year period. At its peak, 
and I'm not sure uh, exactly where we're at statistically at the moment, but at its peak, which was continuing for some time, meaning when the last time I checked the statistic, it was a consistent statistic for what had been 11 or 12 months. And the suicide rate for uh, returning soldiers from Iraq and Afghanistan, U.S. soldiers, was 22 per day. It's almost one an hour. Which, if you stop to think about that, is horrific, first of all. Second of all, feels like a horrific betrayal of the public contract that those people signed up for when they signed up to give, you know, whatever their life could give to serve their country and are left with a shock and trauma cycle that they would rather put an end to their own life and simply not experience anymore than deal with. And the truth is, I know exactly what that feels like because I certainly went through a period of time in which it was so horrible and so awful, I would come back and forth to suicidal thoughts. Oh my God, I just want it to end. I just want it to end. I just want it to end. And luckily, uh, never came up with a successful plan and actually offed myself, but certainly was so overwhelmed by the despair of the feelings of that horrific trauma that sometimes I just wanted it to end, just wanted it to end, just wanted it to be over. So I can understand how someone could decide to take their own life. But the fact that that many, that, that we have a, a, a structure uh, for veterans that allows that, that is okay. It's like, eh, didn't, didn't like jump in in a way that was like, oh my gosh, we have to immediately like address veterans sort of mental health like immediately and like try to stop the you know, systemic massive amounts of uh, soldiers in despair who are committing suicide. It's horrible. And so for someone like myself who's experienced that and for who knows that there are other soldiers whose records are buried, whose memories have been suppressed, who have to deal with this, that at some point, many of them also feel the same way and feel despondent and might just want to kill themselves. And if we're looking at a suicide rate among, that's tracked among Iraqi and Afghanistan veterans that was 22 a day well what what do you what do we think that is for people who have experienced decades more of even more horrific trauma than that not to belittle in any way shape or form the trauma that iraqi war or afghanistan war veterans have had to experience in no way shape or form but objectively speaking the number of hours per month of vicious, violent, gory combat that I've experienced in my career is higher than anybody else that I know, unfortunately for me. And I, other soldiers who go through these same experiences, it's, it's got to be similar. So what's the suicide rate got to be for those people? Like, we're not tracking it, but it's, it's, it's got to suck. It's got to, it's got to be way too high. So if one, one person decides that it, it's okay to live because someone else has had an experience that makes it make sense for them, gives them a reason to not feel completely uh, despondent and in despair and wants to do something to like reclaim a stolen life, then that makes it worth it. Right? So um, I don't do what I do for me. I, I would be quiet about this. I would not talk about it. I would not share it. I would be perfectly happy to do something else and not do this. It'd be perfect, perfectly okay with it. But if by taking a certain amount of, of a brave stance, because I, I stick my neck out in such a way that anybody can say or criticize what they think, you know, must be a set of experiences that couldn't possibly be real. And so they're just like, 
put me in a box and put me in a label where whatever I'm saying couldn't possibly be true because they just simply can't believe the reality that I've experienced could exist. So I put myself in the position where I have, uh, I have lost relationships over this. Uh, I, I am divorced because of this. Uh, I have done, I, I have seen damage to my personal life, my family life, um, because I choose to do this. Uh, so I'm not doing it for me. Uh, I am doing it for two reasons. One, because as a soldier, I was asked to by a chain of command that I respect and who would like there to be a public relations voice to disseminate certain information that the general public needs to understand about covert military space programs, the trade embargoes, the information embargoes, the travel embargoes, to understand what happens when we get past the disclosure point, what happens with intergalactic trade, what happens with knowledge, what happens with information, what happens with travel, what happens with technology, and why that's important. In, in a world in which civilization teeters on the edge of having more problems than it has solutions for, that maybe there is a structure and, and, a, and a design that's going to get us through this process. And that if I can, again, as part of this first part of why I do this, the request by superiors, if I can mitigate some panic by some people and can, again, save lives by encouraging people as we go through this process to not freaking freak out and not kill themselves or somebody else or do something dumb that gets themselves killed, then I have succeeded at my job and, and I, I've, it's worth it. The other part of my job, again, is to help people who have had this traumatic experiences in their own way, in their own right, in their own memories to deal with. And if I mitigate the loss of one life so that one of those people can feel like that they're not have to be in complete despondent despair, then again, I have done my job properly. So um, that's why I do what I do because that's my experience. That's what I had to go through to get from the beginning of that to the end of that. It was, it's not something that I think a lot of people really want to hear me talk about. Um, it's not something I want to talk about. It's not something that I want to spend a tremendous amount of time getting into and talking about my personal emotional healing process, but it, it's fundamentally who I, why I am who I am. It's fundamentally why I do what I do. It's fundamentally why I do this to try and help other people who may have the same problem. So for, for whatever criticisms people may want to have uh, of who I am or what I claim, I can say with confidence um, that I have, I can say with confidence that I have done my homework. I have done my personal work. I have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of introspective personal work to get to something, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have determined through the process of elimination of all other possibilities is the only thing left that could possibly be true for me and that I have to accept is my memories, my experiences, who I am, what I am, and this is why I am here where I am and I do what I do. So I think that's me yakking about that for two hours. So I, I'm perfectly happy to answer questions right. if anybody has any. Um, thank, thank you so much, Randy. That was, um, yeah, an amazing recollection and really appreciate you sharing. It's been really terrifying. I, I think even as an adult, if I went through what you went through, like, you know, seeing that avian in the living room, I would have. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, no. I, if, if, if. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If, if there was really one, like, caveat to this entire, like, set of experiences of both having the experiences and recalling them, it's terror. It's yeah. absolute fear and terror. So if, if anything, I can say that I have had to overcome more personal fear and terror than anybody that I know just to get through this and remember things that I don't want to remember. Yeah. 
Mm, yeah, and and thank you too. I think there are lots of people that, and I think I know one too that are going through this and just don't know what to do and and too afraid to go there. Yeah, I, I get emails from people. Yeah. I get contacted from people all the time. Who, uh, you know, it starts with I think I may have been dot dot dot. I remember this. I think this happened. My dad worked. You know, was in the Air Force. Like, there, there's just so many stories that people have emailed to me and sent to me to talk to me about. And I would say that one out of a hundred, if that, if that wants to talk about it publicly, would like to like, I'll be the next person to tell my story to the general public. No, 99 out of a hundred have zero uh, compulsion or desire to want to do what I do. And so they often thank me very much for doing what I do because they say I can never do it. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Because again, 99 out of 100 have no desire to be sitting in this position talking to you or the rest of the world uh, about their personal experiences for the reasons that I've said. They're terrifying. And why, why would you want to sit around and just like recall the most horrible traumatic things that have ever occurred to you? You know, I don't know to... I don't know too many people that want to just sit around all the time and talk about their child abuse stories or their rape stories or their, you know, you know, kid or their torture stories. You know, I mean, these are just not things that people want to talk about because they're not fun to recall. But um, again, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've done the personal work and that I was designed to self repair so that I could go through this process. A lot of people that I uh, talk to do not have the same uh, programming or the same training, and they're really just suffering trying to sort it out. And it's difficult for them to get help through the behavioral health system because people want to label them as having you know, crazy disorders instead of treating them like trauma victims, which is how they need to be treated. Because um, you certainly, you can't medicate this kind of stuff away. You can't just mm -hmm. take pills and not, and just be like, I'm fine. Like I, you know, had a friend who was a psychiatrist and he is probably another one of the main reasons why I feel sane because he and I spent quite a bit of time actually going through the DSM four and looking at the different disorders and, you know, going down the symptomology and going, no, 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 no. I mean, so we really eliminated all of these other crazies uh, and came up with a, you know, like check 18 out of 19 boxes on the PTSD chart. So if, you know, people are not being treated properly as PTSD sufferers, they're being treated in some other way. They're being given in some cases medication that can harm them or upset the balance of their brain. I actually feel pretty strongly that I had an ex-girlfriend who was probably repressing some memories based on some of the things that she told me and had a couple of manic episodes that she got into the behavioral health system uh, because of, and they ended up putting her on some medications that I think ruined her for the rest of her life. Uh, the last time I spoke to her, she's just, this is someone who is a PhD candidate in microbiology at Berkeley University. Smart girl, okay, smart girl. And what they did to her brain with the, uh, you know, chemical drug treatments uh, profiles that they were giving her for what they were calling a bipolar disorder, which I do not think was a bipolar disorder, uh, ruined the poor thing, just ruined a mind that was at one point one of the finest academic minds, you know, at her university. And, you know, kind of has just been dropped down to a place of, of, Way, way more average, you know, intellect IQ ability than she previously had. And I feel that it's a shame that, you know, whatever they did to her was not helpful. It didn't work out. So if you don't treat people for the right thing, you end up treating for them with the wrong thing, which can be just as harmful as not treating them in some cases. So, yeah, yeah I think there needs to be some awareness about it. And there needs to be just some lack of judgment. And, and I mean, not like, critical judgment i mean stop judging people for what they think they may have happened to them like just say okay even as a mental health professional i'm not so sure i can be down with what you're saying is occurring but let's go ahead and 
treat it like it's a trauma instead of like it's a, a mental just a mental illness and maybe that will actually work better if someone's really checking off the trauma boxes uh instead of just presuming because they're telling you an outlandish story that they must be crazy mm, exactly I, I if there was any change that that you know needs to happen that needs to be it and i would love to see that but most of what's happening is on the fringe most of the hypnotherapists and healers that i know are outside of uh, major medicine and major medical. And I've only met, you know, a couple psychiatrists uh, in my entire lifetime who were even vaguely open to the idea that these things might not be, you know, mental health disorders. So it's rare that uh, mental health professionals want to treat these kinds of things as legitimate traumas and would rather label people uh, so where do people have to turn? They can't go to their doctor. They most of their friends and their family they can't turn to. So you know what do they have? And, and I and I just wish that there was greater resources to help people who are traumatized veterans who mm. served their time and did their duty and are being treated like garbage uh, and left to commit suicide in much the same way that we let Iraqi and Afghanistan uh, soldiers, veterans coming home also be just left to emotional, psychological despair and suicide. It's terrible any way you look at it. And, and I, I, you know, if, if I was gonna stand up and shake my fist and stomp, that's what I would shake my fist and stomp about. That shit ain't right. Mm, exactly. And it needs to be corrected. But I, I don't know where really where we are until we hit a post-disclosure kind of world where most of those people are going to get that from the healthcare system as we as it stands. Yeah. So that's just where we're at with that and it sucks. Okay. Why why that experience? Why that thing? Why that memory? Why, 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 why? And the answer was super simple it, it was like well we wanted to leave a imprint of something that was so strong of a memory that was so strong and so vivid and so terrifying and so shocking that you would never forget it ever 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 forget it ever from the moment that it occurred past any point of that past any general suppression of memories that have to do with you know weirdness or extraterrestrials it was absolutely a a specific mark that someone was putting in my life experience and my memory experience so that i would have that and never forget it so that i would have this incredibly vivid memory of that experience because apparently as from the story that i just told it was critical it was critical for me to have that and it, it was able for me to make those connections. So somehow they had the intelligence, big brains, I think they're super smart in my experience communicating with them, uh, was that they understood that somehow I was going to need that for my process. And so they stuck this memory in by giving me this experience that was so terrifying and so shocking that I would never, ever, ever, ever be able to forget it.